I wanted today to talk about what I think of as the five stages of learning improvisation. If you're going to want one of those meme-tastic YouTube videos where I just, you know, play a jazz improvisation with ever, you know, more complicated chords or whatever, um, I'm afraid it's not going to be one of those. So um, <laughs> feel free to leave an angry comment and <laughs> a dislike on your way out. This is going to be a little bit more in depth. So first thing is that this is not a hierarchy, actually. Even though I'm sort of talking about these as being you know, stages that you might go through in your learning. In fact, actually, um, it's not necessary that these be followed in a particular order. Um, actually, people can get really amazing in just one area. Um, I'm constantly surprised by people um, and how they learn and how they play. And I think that diversity is a wonderful thing. So please don't please don't take this as some sort of thing where you have to follow this. And if you don't, and if you, you know, if you're still a lick player and that's what you like, um, you know, you're somehow doing it wrong or anything else. It's always a danger on the internet. Everybody likes to sort of um, kind of take your argument to the extreme and then disprove it. I know I do that with other people. Um, so I'm just going to try and protect myself against that as much as possible before I get started. <laughs> That said, many players seem to have gone through this process. This is very similar to Clark Terry's imitate, assimilate, innovate idea, concept of how to learn jazz. Um, so you'll see some commonalities with that. I've wandered back and forth through this in a really disorganized way. Um, I don't think this is limited to jazz at all, even though I am talking about jazz today. I think this process might relate to other improvisational things, even outside of music, maybe to, I don't know, to drama, comedy maybe. And lastly, I'm going to close my favourite Matrix quote, which is, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. So don't try to jump through the sequence, you know, trust it and allow it to, to take shape over time. Stage one, so what I call the naive. At this stage, this is kind of, you know, when you come to your first jazz workshop, you know, maybe you're a kid and you're going to something like uh, in London, we have this thing called Nijo, Tomorrow's Warriors, groups like that. So you might be a young person just sort of turning up for your first improvisation session or, you know, to learn a little bit more about jazz. You might not really listen to jazz before. You might listen to a little bit, but not, not in great depth. You're intrigued, but you don't really know anything about it much. And this is the situation I came to jazz with, and I'm sure it's the same for many people. My first contact with jazz was through the education system, and I suspect that's more and more common these days. Um, and, you know, I think what, I mean, I, I criticised it in my last video, but let me, let me advocate now for that sort of uh, thing that people do where, you know, they give you a simple tune like Little Sunflower or Chameleon or something, and they give you scales to improvise on. You know, you want something that sounds attractive, right? So um, if it's like paints for a two-year-old, if you give them all the colours, then they're just going to mix it together and they're going to get brown right? So if you want them to produce something that looks attractive, that you can, you know, have on your wall and go, oh, look, my toddler did that, you know, and uh, be very proud, then it's good to have colours that look good when they mix together. So for instance, red and yellow are a good idea, or, you know, maybe yellow and blue, you know, um, but not red and green. Just, just, just like have colours that work together, then let them dry, and then they can do another two colours on top. And that will look better than just like a brown mess. Now, this is not to say brown is bad. After all, Rembrandt was quite famous for mixing brown into everything. And it gave his paintings a sort of richness and a kind of um, depth. Which I think I'm just going to mention because it's like an example of how a rule for somebody who's at a low level um, or just starting, which may be helpful to produce an attractive result, is not necessarily... The correct thing for a master obviously Rembrandt wasn't a two-year-old daubing on a canvas <laughs> you know so um uh but at each stage you want something as attractive as possible to result and I think that's the thing that gets forgotten now I think there's other ways possibly better ways to do that than chord scale theory at the early stages but that is the reason why that is used now you can be really creative in this space of naivety you might not actually know a bebop line from a hole in the road but you can produce something attractive or even quite original and I'd, I'd put like Ornette Coleman in that category 
This is about uh, learning licks, listening to lots of records, picking out things you like. It could be from solos, could be from heads. Um, David Baker in his How to Play Bebop books suggests that if you learn 50 Bebop heads, you will learn all of the language you ever need to know. Um, and I think this is kind of similar to the way Barry Harry used to teach it according to um, Charles McPherson. I never heard Barry Harris talk about transcription ever. Um, I think he was basically encouraging his students, at least according to McPherson, to um, learn bebop heads by ear, learn repertoire, and then you have something to play on gigs, and then also you understand how the language works. The solos, although I don't think for a minute that Barry Harris didn't transcribe loads of Charlie Parker and Bud Powell, because, I mean, he did. <laughs> um, but at the same time, um, at this stage, that wasn't so important. And I think that's something which I've tended to gear myself towards as well, just because, you know, it saves time, you know. Um, but, you know, you can obviously transcribe solos if you want. Um, it could be a whole solo or a whole chorus if the mood takes you, or it could just be bits. Um, I remember Peter Bernstein saying that he never really transcribed anything beyond one night Charlie Christian solo in terms of like a whole solo, but he was always listening to music and picking out things he liked and just sort of, you know, learning them and then playing around with them. So uh, this is less about true impro improv, true improvisation, Bleeding chunks that can be sequenced over two fives and the like. So what do I mean by that? Well, for instance, if I've got um, this little line from Groove in High, um, in the original key, it's this. Okay, this just happens over an A minor, B7, right? It's a two five lick. So if we take a tune that has lots of two fives in, um, it could be something like, you know, Autumn Leaves, for instance. There's a two five there, right? So we can play play that lick there or up here and then maybe um, add a little res resolution into the um, the one chord so something like this just going down the scale to the third that would be an example of the lick that you could then use through uh, different chord progressions so if I you know if I was Gonna do it in a different key, maybe I'll be looking at one in E flat. I'll be doing it like this. Okay, so you know, you, you transpose this lick to all different keys and stuff. And then you can play through every time you see a two five one, you can apply this lick. So you just, you know, look at or, or a two five because it's actually a two five lick, should I say? Now, every time you see a two five any key you play that lick there's actually a time-honored way to do it like generations of jazz musicians have learned this way in terms of theory all you need to know is what chords this little chunk of language happens over so is it a two five is it just a static dominant chord or a major chord or a minor chord or something is it over some sort of turnaround um, bank that knowledge look for a similar context and if you get good at changing keys maybe on different tunes um, and then you'll, you're able to um, apply this stuff as much as possible. As I say, it's not really about improvisation. But you will start to sound good, and you will start to sound like jazz. However, you may also get told off by an elder. So there's um, some good stories. Pat Metheny and Bruce Foreman spring to mind. Uh, Bruce Foreman getting told off by older musicians for sounding like West Montgomery. You know, if I wanted West Montgomery, I would have booked West Montgomery. <laughs> Um, um, and you know that's if you copy one player I think Pat Metheny and Bruce are both particularly into West so they copied him a lot maybe you copy lots of different players the same thing applies a well-known UK sax player I know was told once uh, by an elder yeah I have those records too so um, the message to take from that is not that you've done the wrong thing you've earned the right to be told off this doesn't mean your work is worthless, but rather that you've progressed to the next stage. Well done. And this stage is about finding your own voice. However, some people remain lick players and just through knowing million licks are able to acquire a type of freedom and start to develop their own voice. And actually, that's not uncommon with good bebop players. Um, Manouche, gypsy jazz style players often play this way. Um, and obviously, we can think of the blues being a, you know, an example of a whole area of music where it's very much about the tradition. And oh, this is a Freddie King lick. Oh, this is a, you know, this is a Stevie Ray Vaughan lick. This is a, um, well, Stevie Ray Vaughan got this from Albert Collins or something, you know. The next two stages are kind of the same sort of stage, but I'm going to chop them into two bits for clarity. Um, so the first one is take licks and make them your own. It's often good to have small chunks to hide the influences. So if I play this, that might be less recognizable. 
So then I can use that on a, you know, 251 for instance. And I know that could also work over an isolated minor chord. You know, like that for instance. So that could be a, a minor lick instead. Um, I'm using it over a major 2-5 here. But I could also, for instance, know that in this is a different context as well. I can take a half diminished chord and I can substitute the half diminished chord, as in this case it's D half diminished, I can substitute it for a F minor. So I can play this lick in F minor like this. Maybe take it up a, a minor third. And then start to spin it out like that. So I played the same lick in three different keys. In this key, over the um, D half diminished. Put up a minor third, so I'm now playing it in A flat minor. Over the um, G7, to give an altered sound, and then over the C minor, so I can play a whole two five one using that lick three times. Go something like that, for instance. I could do it over. What is this thing called? Love. Okay, so I'm using different contexts there. Um, I could also start to use, um, you know, just vary it a little bit. So maybe, for instance, I mean, this, this lick goes like this. I could, I could go, skip a note out. What's, uh, this one starts one, two, three, four, one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two. Four, I could start on one. One, two, three, four, one. Feels different, right? One, two, three, four, maybe I'll skip out a note. One, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, and two. And then maybe it sits a bit better rhythmically. So all this kind of stuff. Um, either you have a theoretical understanding in the sort of textbook sense, or you have like loads of rules of thumb, loads of substitution ideas and things like that. It doesn't matter. You apply them, you vary language, and you get better at making it sound less like, hey, I'm quoting grooving high, and a little bit more like, here I am actually coming up with my own stuff. Um, you know, so at that point, um, your own voice might even start to emerge. Um, you might not be making much up that's on the spot, but that's okay. Your variation chops will improve, though, so you might be able to do this better on the fly. Another aspect of mastery, stage four, is constructing language. Now, Barry Harris is great for this. It's great for, he, he was great for going from, um, you know, just scales and things to language, and I've done videos on that, you know, for instance, the added note rules, how we can use added note rules together with um, arpeggios and so on and so forth. Okay, um, you're developing licks here from the ground up using your knowledge, um, which is often something that people kind of get you to do right away with chord scale theory and things like that. But actually, I think this is something that comes further along the line once you've actually seen many examples of jazz lines being done. You'll be in a much better position to do this. Um, so chord scale theory, for instance, would be a good example. But, you know, instead of just like, you know, all right, okay, so what am I playing on, um, uh, you know, on D minor? Okay, I'm playing the Dorian and then you do this kind of thing. You're much, much more in a better, uh, a better sort of state of mind to go like, well, this will make the Dorian sound more like a jazz line if I put maybe a fourth before it. Like an old school sort of Charlie Christian thing or maybe a pattern of fourths. It starts to feel more like jazz, you know? You, you have enough knowledge then at that point. To be able to start producing jazz language with just that scale. Uh, and I'm also using chromatics and other things as well um, because I know how to use them. So I've studied enough jazz lines and obviously Barry Harris is helpful for that as well. But you don't have to do Barry Harris. You know, you could just look at a load of examples of jazz lines and be able to do it from there. I find that things get pretty theoretical at this stage. You're talking a lot about scales, a lot about you know, rules and stuff. Um, so it's why I think it should come later in the process because I think if you do that too early, it can get in the way of actually getting to know the music. Um, I think also at this point, you 
can tend to become a quite noty player. Um, I certainly found that I got very eighth noty, I mean, with a few twiddles. Um, when I was doing a lot more Barry Harris stuff, I've kind of moved a little bit away from that, actually, in the past couple of years. Um, and I think most Barry Harris educated and good chord scale improvised to be this type of noty player. Uh, not playing licks, but being able to spin out long lines that go through the changes effortlessly, and they sound great doing it. The experienced naive. This, for me, is something I really enjoy. Um, not everybody is interested in becoming this, but I, I think like um, some of my favourite players are. And it's taking things and making them into music, often deceptively simple things. So, I mean, for instance, I, I was really um, amazed looking at Peter Bernstein's playing, the way he'll just take, like, you know, a chord voicing or something and turn it into a line. And actually, the more I kind of go on with it, the more I realise I can just take things like this. <laughs> which is basically just like arpeggiating this. <laughs> and I could turn it into language, you know? With a few extra half steps. You know, um, that sounds interesting, but it's really all based on just, you know, basic chord shapes. Something like this. You know, it's not, nothing, nothing terribly complicated there, but I find that I can actually take things now and start to turn them into, into music. And I think that sometimes I forget that it does require a degree of experience and knowledge of the music to do that without wanting to sort of beat my chest or anything. I certainly don't think I'm at the grandmaster level, but I do think I'm becoming more free as an improviser. And for Peter Bernstein, particularly like my hero for this really on guitar, you go and listen to early Peter Bernstein. Um, you can hear him sort of playing Grant Green licks and Charlie Christian licks and things. But as he kind of goes on, he does that less and less. And he, he is less and less sort of identifiable jazz language. It's kind of, and he's talked about trying to sort of build something out of, out of the song using kind of raw materials, not just throwing notes on a chord. And I think that, that approach has been massively influential on me in the past couple of years. I certainly think Monk was more that way as well. I mean, Barry told a story about him, you know, hearing this, this piano in, because he used to share a house with Monk, right? Um, he heard this, this piano playing um, and he didn't know who it was. It sounded like Bud Powell, amazing, you know, fluent bebop. I sort of went to follow the sound and he realised it was coming from, from Monk. Monk was playing this. And then Monk just turns around and goes, and goes back to shredding. Um, and you can certainly hear him play Harlem Stride on his recordings. I mean, real Harlem Stride is really hard. It's not easy piano playing. Um, Barry sort of points out how good his chops were. I mean, he, that Monk grew up with James P. Johnson and Fats Waller. I think he was a bit older than a lot of the boppers. Um, so he really came from that kind of old school uh, jazz piano world. And he had great chops at that, you know. So um, his style of music was really the process of the, the result of the process of refinement and distillation of stuff. Um, and that's what I think this is about. You know, it's trying to get away from licks, it's trying to get away from cliches a little bit, but it's also kind of going for almost a childlike spontaneity, often a sim childlike simplicity that kind of maybe belies a deeper sophistication. Um, and this is where you start to wear your learning a little bit more lightly than perhaps if you play loads of eighth notes. Um, again, you know, any of these stages, you can be a really great player and I'm sure there's other things, other ways of doing it that I haven't thought about. But I, I just hope you found it interesting and helpful as a discussion. And maybe it can focus some of your ideas about how you go about improvisation and um, how you learn. Anyway, thanks for watching. Um, see you soon.